I'm sitting at the kitchen table, staring at the old chipped mug that's been with me for more years than I care to remember. It's just a regular Tuesday evening, but somehow it feels like the weight of my entire life is pressing down on me. I'm Emma, a 45-year-old woman who feels like she's living a life filled with more regrets than joys. My husband, Richard, is sitting across from me, scrolling through his phone, utterly disinterested in anything I have to say. I met him when I was just a bright-eyed 20-year-old. He was charming, charismatic, and everything I thought I wanted. But here we are, 25 years later, and I can barely recognize the man I fell in love with. Dinner was good, I say, attempting to start a conversation. He doesn't even look up. It was okay. You've made better. His words sting, but I'm used to it. This has been my life for the past several years. The man I married, who once looked at me like I was his entire world, now barely acknowledges my existence unless it's to criticize me. I remember when I first introduced Richard to my dad. My dad was a police officer, a man who had seen the worst of people in his line of work. He took one look at Richard and said, Emma, that man is bad news. But I was young and in love, and I thought my dad was just being overprotective. Dad, you don't know him like I do. Richard is a good man, I had insisted. Emma, I've been a cop for over 30 years. I know how to read people. That man is going to bring you nothing but trouble, my father had replied, his voice laced with concern. But I didn't listen. In fact, I did something I now deeply regret. I cut my father out of my life. Richard suggested it, saying we didn't need negative people who didn't believe in us. And like a fool, I agreed. For 25 years, I didn't speak to my dad. I didn't call him, didn't visit, didn't even tell him when I had my daughter, Lily, who's now in college. My thoughts are interrupted by Richard's voice. Are you even listening to me? I realize he's been talking while I was lost in my thoughts. Sorry, what were you saying? I was saying that you need to start taking better care of yourself. You've let yourself go. And it's embarrassing, he says, his tone cold. I feel a lump form in my throat. This is my life, a husband who finds every opportunity to bring me down. And as I sit there, taking in his harsh words, I can't help but think that my father was right all along. My phone rings, pulling me out of my thoughts. I glance at the caller ID and my heart skips a beat. It's a number I haven't seen in over two decades. It's my dad. I answer, my voice shaky. Hello? Emma, it's your dad. I need to talk to you, it's important. His voice is weak, nothing like the strong, confident tone I remember. Dad, I'm so sorry for everything. I start, but he cuts me off. Emma, I'm sick. The doctors say I don't have much time left. I have cancer. The room spins around me as his words sink in. My dad, the man I turned my back on, is dying. And suddenly, all the years of silence, all the missed opportunities to make things right, weigh heavily on me. Dad, I'm so sorry. I'll come to see you. I'll help in any way I can. I say, tears streaming down my face. After ending the call, I turn to Richard, hoping, maybe foolishly, for some kind of support. Richard, my dad is sick. He has cancer. I need to help him. His reaction is like a slap in the face. Good. The man never liked me. Can't wait for him to be gone. His words are like a knife to my heart. In that moment, I realize just how blind I've been. My husband, the man I chose over my own father is cruel and heartless. And I can't help but wonder if my life would have been different if I had just listened to my dad all those years ago. I'm sitting on the edge of the bed in our bedroom, my hands trembling. The room feels cold, even though it's a warm night. Richard's words keep echoing in my head. Can't wait for him to be gone. How can he be so heartless? I thought I knew him, but it seems I've been living with a stranger. I pick up my phone again, dialing my dad's number. It rings and rings, and then finally, he picks up. Emma? His voice is weak but filled with hope. Dad, I'm so sorry. I'm going to help you. I don't know how yet, but I will find a way, I say, my voice choked with emotion. Emma, you don't have to. You've got your own life. No, Dad. You're my father. I should have been there for you all these years. I'm going to make this right. We talk a little more. He tells me about his condition, 
about the treatments he needs but can't afford. My heart aches. I've missed so much, and now, when he needs me the most, I feel helpless. After the call, I sit there, lost in thought. Then something inside me clicks. I can't let my father suffer because of my mistakes. I need to do something. I go to the living room where Richard is watching TV. Richard, I've decided. I'm going to help my father. He needs money for his treatments. I'm going to use our savings. He looks at me like I've lost my mind. You're going to do what? Are you crazy? That's our money, Emma. We saved that for us, for our future. There won't be a future if I let my father die knowing I could have helped him. I can't live with that, I say, my resolve firm. He laughs, a cold, mocking laugh. So the prodigal daughter returns. You think playing the good daughter now will make up for all the years you ignored him? It's pathetic. His words sting, but I don't let them sway me. I don't care what you think. I'm doing this. I go to our home office and start transferring the money. It's a lot, almost all our savings, but it doesn't matter. This is for my dad, for all the years I wasn't there for him. When I finish, I feel a sense of relief, but it's short-lived. Richard storms into the room, his face red with anger. You actually did it. You gave our money to that old man. He's my father, Richard. He's dying. What was I supposed to do? Just let him suffer? You were supposed to think about us, about our life together. But you've always been selfish, Emma, always thinking about yourself. I'm stunned. How can he twist this into something about him? Selfish? I'm trying to save my father's life. How is that selfish? He doesn't answer. Instead, he turns and leaves the room, slamming the door behind him. I'm left standing there, feeling more alone than ever. But there's also a sense of determination inside me. For the first time in years, I'm standing up for what I believe in. It's scary, but it also feels right. I pack a small bag with some clothes and essentials. I don't know what's going to happen next, but I can't stay here, not with Richard, not now. I write a note, telling him I'm going to my dad's, that I need some time to figure things out. I don't know if he'll even care, but I leave it on the kitchen counter anyway. Then, with my bag in hand, I step out of the house. The night air is cool on my skin, and as I walk to my car, I feel like I'm taking the first steps towards a new life. A life where I'm no longer bound by regrets and what-ifs. A life where I can try to make things right, even if it's a little too late. The drive to my dad's house feels endless. Streetlights blur past, and I'm alone with my thoughts, a mix of fear and determination. I haven't seen my dad in over 25 years, and now I'm rushing to him in the middle of the night because he's sick and I'm all he's got. When I finally pull up to the familiar old house, my heart is racing. The place looks much the same, though a bit more worn. I hesitate for a moment before getting out of the car. What am I going to say? How is he going to react? Taking a deep breath, I walk up to the front door and knock. It takes a few moments, but then the door opens, and there he is. My dad. He's older, frailer, but it's undeniably him. Emma, he says, his voice cracking. You came. I nod, fighting back tears. I'm here, Dad. I'm so sorry. He steps aside, letting me in. The house smells the same as I remember, a mix of coffee and old books. We go to the living room and sit down. It's awkward at first, but then we start talking, and it's like the years start to melt away. I'm so sorry, Dad. I should have been here, I say, my voice thick with emotion. It's okay, Emma. You're here now. That's what matters. We talk about his illness, about the treatments he needs. He shows me the medical bills, and they're staggering, but I reassure him that I've got it covered. He tries to protest, but I won't hear it. Then I tell him about Richard, about how he reacted when I said I was going to help. I don't go into all the details, just that we had a fight and that I needed some time away. My dad listens, his expression somber. I warned you about him, Emma, but you were young, in love. I understand. But you were right, Dad. You were right all along. He reaches out, taking my hand. What are you going to do now? I shake my head. I don't know, Dad. I just don't know. We sit there for a while, just talking. It's strange, but it feels good, like we're making up for lost time. Eventually, I get up to leave. 
I've got a lot to figure out, and it's late. But as I'm about to walk out the door, my dad stops me. Emma, wait. There's something you should know. He goes to his desk and pulls out a folder, thick with papers. I've been keeping tabs on Richard, ever since you married him. I knew he was bad news, and I wanted to protect you, just in case. He hands me the folder. It's all in there. His business deals, the women, everything. I wanted you to have it, just in case. I'm stunned. I take the folder, feeling its weight. Dad, I... Thank you. He nods, a sad smile on his face. I always wanted what was best for you, Emma. Always. I hug him, holding back tears. I know, Dad. I know. The morning after I visited my dad, I'm sitting at my kitchen table, the folder he gave me lying unopened in front of me. I'm scared of what's inside, scared of what it means for my life, my marriage. But I know I can't ignore it. Taking a deep breath, I open the folder. There are bank statements, photos, notes. It's overwhelming. As I start to sift through the papers, the reality of my situation begins to sink in. Richard has been living a double life, and I was too blind to see it. There are photos of him with other women, some of them looking way too cozy. There are bank statements showing large amounts of money being moved around, and notes about shady business deals. It's a lot to process. I feel sick to my stomach. How could I have been so naive? How could I have ignored all the signs? I spend the morning going through everything, and by the time I'm done, I'm shaking with anger and betrayal. But there's also a sense of clarity. I know what I need to do. I call my dad. Dad, I looked through the folder. It's... it's a lot. I'm sorry, Emma. I didn't want to burden you with it, but you needed to know. I understand, and thank you. I'm going to confront him. I can't let this go on any longer. Be careful, Emma. He's a dangerous man. I will be. I have to do this, for me, for us. After we hang up, I get ready. I feel like I'm preparing for battle. I put the most damning evidence in a smaller folder and head to Richard's office. When I get there, his secretary tries to stop me, but I push past her. I storm into his office, and he looks up, surprised. Emma, what are you doing here? We need to talk, I say, my voice steady even though my hands are shaking. He smirks. About what? About this, I say, throwing the folder on his desk. About your lies, your cheating, your dirty business. He goes pale, but then he regains his composure. You don't know what you're talking about. I know everything, Richard. My dad has been keeping tabs on you since we got married. It's all here. The women, the money, everything. He starts to get angry. Your dad? That old fool? He's just trying to break us up. He's always hated me. He was right about you, and I was too blind to see it, but not anymore. He stands up, coming around the desk. You're not going to ruin me, Emma. You're my wife. You're supposed to stand by me. Not anymore. I want a divorce, Richard. I want out of this sham of a marriage. He laughs, a cold, bitter laugh. You think you can just walk away? You think you can take me down? I won't let you. I'll ruin you first. I stand my ground, even though I'm scared. I'm not afraid of you anymore. I know the truth, and I'm not going to let you control me any longer. He looks at me, really looks at me, and I can see the realization dawning in his eyes. He knows he's lost. Get out, he says finally. Get out and don't come back. The next few days are a blur. I spend most of my time at my dad's house, trying to figure out my next move. The thought of going back to the house I shared with Richard makes my skin crawl. I can't face him, not yet. My dad is a rock during all of this. He listens, offers advice, but mostly just lets me talk. It's comforting, being here with him. It feels like I'm making up for lost time. One afternoon, we're sitting in the living room when my phone rings. It's a number I don't recognize, but I answer it anyway. Hello? Is this Emma Richards? A man's voice asks. Yes, it is. Who's this? My name is Detective Harris. I'm with the city police department. I'd like to talk to you about your husband. My heart skips a beat. What about him? We've been investigating him for some time now. We believe he's involved in a number of illegal activities. We received some information recently that has accelerated our investigation. 
I glance at my dad, who's watching me closely. What kind of information? It's best if we discuss this in person. Can you come down to the station? Yes, of course. I'll be there as soon as I can. I hang up, feeling a mix of fear and relief. It's happening. It's really happening. Dad, the police want to talk to me about Richard. They think he's involved in illegal activities. My dad nods. It's about time. You need to tell them everything, Emma. Don't hold back. I won't. I'm done protecting him. I head to the police station, my mind racing. When I get there, Detective Harris is waiting for me. He's a middle-aged man with kind eyes and a serious demeanor. Thank you for coming in, Mrs. Richards, he says as he leads me to an interview room. Please, call me Emma, and thank you for seeing me. We sit down, and he gets right to the point. We've been investigating your husband for some time. We believe he's involved in a number of fraudulent activities, including money laundering and embezzlement. I nod, trying to keep my composure. I believe you're right. I have some evidence that might help. I tell him everything. About the folder my dad gave me, about the bank statements, the photos, the notes. I tell him about the confrontation with Richard, about how he threatened me. Detective Harris listens, taking notes. When I'm done, he looks at me, his expression serious. This is very helpful, Emma. With your testimony and the evidence you've provided, we can build a strong case against your husband. What happens now? I ask, feeling a mix of emotions. We'll continue our investigation, gather more evidence. It's likely we'll need you to testify in court. Are you prepared for that? I nod, feeling a surge of determination. Yes. I'll do whatever it takes to make sure he pays for what he's done. Detective Harris nods. Good, we'll be in touch. And Emma, you're doing the right thing. I spend my days helping Dad around the house and taking him to his doctor's appointments. His health seems to be holding steady, a small blessing in the midst of everything else. One afternoon, while we're sitting in the living room, my phone buzzes with a message from Detective Harris. My heart leaps into my throat as I read it. Case moving forward. Charges filed against Richard. We'll need you to testify. I let out a breath I didn't realize I was holding. Dad, they're charging Richard. It's actually happening. Dad looks up from his newspaper, his eyes soft. Good. It's about time he faced the consequences. The day of the trial arrives. I wear a simple blue dress, wanting to look presentable, but not overdressed. Dad insists on coming with me, even though I tell him he doesn't have to. I'm not letting you face that man alone, he says, his voice firm. The courtroom is intimidating, with its high ceilings and wooden pews. Richard is already there, looking smug in his expensive suit. When he sees me, his expression darkens. I take my seat, trying to ignore the knots in my stomach. Dad sits next to me, a solid presence at my side. The trial begins. The prosecutor lays out the case against Richard, Fraud, embezzlement, money laundering. The evidence is overwhelming. I can see Richard squirming in his seat. Then it's my turn to testify. I take the stand, my hands shaking slightly. The prosecutor asks me to tell the court about my relationship with Richard, about the money he took, the abuse, the threats. I speak slowly, making sure to tell the truth, the whole truth. Richard's lawyer tries to shake me with his questions, but I stand firm. I'm not afraid of Richard anymore. When I'm done, I step down from the stand, feeling like a weight has been lifted from my shoulders. Dad gives me a small smile, his eyes proud. The trial goes on for several days. Witnesses, evidence, testimonies, it all blurs together. But through it all, I can see the case against Richard building, piece by piece. Finally, the jury goes out to deliberate. The weight is agonizing, every second stretching out endlessly. Dad and I don't talk much, just sit together in silent support. Then, the moment of truth arrives. The jury is back. We're called into the courtroom. My heart is pounding so hard I can barely hear anything else. The judge asks the jury for their verdict. The foreman stands up, a slip of paper in his hand. We find the defendant, Richard Richards, guilty on all counts. A wave of relief washes over me, so strong I almost feel dizzy. Richard is staring at the jury, his face a mask of disbelief. The judge thanks the jury and then turns to Richard. 
Given the severity of the crimes and the evidence presented, I hereby sentence you to ten years in prison and order the return of all funds embezzled from Emma Richards. Richards' face crumples. He starts to say something, but the bailiffs are already leading him away. As I walk out of the courtroom, I feel like I'm walking on air. Justice has been served. Richard will pay for what he's done. And for the first time in a long time, I feel like I can finally start to move on. Dad puts his arm around me as we walk. I'm proud of you, Emma. You stood up to him. You did what was right. I lean into him, feeling tears prick my eyes. Thanks, Dad. I couldn't have done it without you. We walk out of the courthouse together, ready to face whatever comes next. Life after the trial feels different, like waking up from a long, turbulent dream. The house is quieter now, just me and Dad. We've settled into a comfortable routine, looking after each other. But there's one thing I haven't done yet, one loose end that still nags at me, my daughter, Lily. I've been thinking about her a lot, about how I've been a less-than-perfect mother, how I let her grow up in a toxic environment. The guilt gnaws at me every day. But today, I decide, is the day I'll try to make things right. I pick up my phone and dial her number, my hands trembling slightly. Mom? Lily sounds surprised when she answers. Hey, Lily, can we talk? Maybe meet somewhere? There's a pause, and for a moment, I'm afraid she'll say no. But then she agrees, and we decide to meet at a small cafe near her college. I arrive early, nervous energy making me fidgety. When Lily walks in, my heart aches. She's grown into a beautiful young woman, but there's a wariness in her eyes that I hate to see. Hey, I say as she sits down. Hey, she replies, her voice guarded. I take a deep breath. Lily, I'm sorry. I know I wasn't the mother you needed. I let you down, let you grow up in a bad situation. I'm so sorry. Lily looks at me, her expression unreadable. Why now, Mom? Why after all this time? I know it's late, way too late. But I've left Richard, your father. He's in jail now. I've been trying to make things right, and I realized I need to start with you. Lily's eyes flicker with something. Pain, maybe, or disappointment. Mom, I spent years wishing you'd leave him, wishing we could just be a normal family. But you always chose him over me. Her words sting, but they're the truth. I know, and I can't change that. But I'm here now. I want to be better, do better, if you give me a chance. We sit in silence for a long time. I can see Lily wrestling with her emotions, and I don't blame her. I've hurt her, and it's not something that can be fixed with a simple apology. Finally, she speaks. I want to believe you, Mom, but it's not easy. I've got a lot of anger, a lot of hurt. I know, and I'm not asking you to forgive me right away. I just want a chance to show you that I can be a better mother, that I can be someone you can rely on. Lily sighs, running a hand through her hair. Okay, we can try, but it's going to take time. A wave of relief washes over me. Thank you, Lily. That's all I'm asking for. We talk for a while longer about her college, her plans for the future. It's awkward at times, but it feels like a start, like maybe there's a chance for us to build something new. Months pass, and the world around me starts to take on a new shape, a new meaning. Dad's health has been improving steadily. The doctors call it a miracle, but I think it's the love and care we've been surrounding him with. He's even started going for short walks around the neighborhood. Today, as I watch him sitting on the porch, reading a newspaper, a sense of calm washes over me. I walk over and sit beside him, taking in the peaceful morning. You're looking better every day, Dad, I say, smiling at him. He looks up, his eyes twinkling. Feeling better too, Emma. It's like I've been given a second chance at life. I nod, feeling a surge of gratitude. We both have, Dad. Just then, Lily arrives. She's been visiting more often, and with each visit, I feel our bond strengthening. She waves at us, a bright smile on her face. Morning, you two, she greets cheerfully. Morning, Lily, Dad replies. Join us. We were just enjoying the morning sun. Lily takes a seat, and for a while, we sit in comfortable silence, basking in the warmth of the sun and each other's company. Mom, I've been thinking, Lily starts, breaking the silence. 
I want to help people who've been in situations like ours. Maybe volunteer at a shelter or something. My heart swells with pride. That's a wonderful idea, Lily. Dad nods in agreement. Using your experience to help others, that's a noble path. Lily's eyes are determined. I want to make a difference, even if it's small. I reach out and squeeze her hand. You already are, sweetheart. Our conversation drifts to lighter topics after that. Plans for the weekend, a new recipe I want to try, the book Dad's been reading. It feels normal, and for the first time in a long time, I feel content. I have my father, my daughter, and a newfound strength within me. I've survived the storm, and now I'm ready to embrace the calm after it, ready to build a new life, a better life, a life where I'm not just surviving, but thriving.